everyone. Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Sri Lanka, a global biodiversity hotspot. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Toby Sinclair. Toby, thank you so much for being here today. I know we've got lots of folks who are very interested in learning all about our Sri Lanka trip. So let's go ahead and dive in. Sunny, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm actually in the UK at the moment. I'm not in Sri Lanka. At the mo uh, I've escaped from the monsoon for a few days, a couple of weeks. Um, but I have lived in South Asia most of my life, all my working life, um, and I've been traveling to Sri Lanka uh, from India, where I'm based, uh, since, the, since 1980, so many, many years. Um, today, I want to just give you uh, an introduction to NatHab's program in Sri Lanka. It's one that we have been running for a few years very successfully. Um, it's one that I, I think led the first and in, the initial trips uh, when we started them seven or eight years back. I was at that time actually living in Colombo and uh, making natural history films. This is a rather bad photograph of me, I'm afraid, on a wet, misty morning in India, bird watching. Over the years, uh, the last 30 years, I have made and worked on as a ground producer, as a location manager, uh, coffee boy, uh, call it what you will, handling the logistics, permissions, permits, and a lot of the research for many natural history films. And in Sri Lanka, I worked on a for three and a half years on a Disney cinema release called Monkey Kingdom, which is available on Disney Plus, if you um, have cable. Um, I did a three-part series called Wild Sri Lanka for, natural, nat for National Geographic um, about six years ago. There were three episodes and covering the three of the regions that we travel to on this itinerary. We look at the coasts and the sea, we look at the forests, and we look at the mountains on the three episodes, and those are three of the regions that we travel to. And I've made many films for the BBC in uh, the Natural History Unit of the BBC, who in the US I either show them on PBS, um, which was the case of a leopard film I made in Yala National Park, uh, I worked with, or two elephant films I made in a place called Galoya. Um, Sorry, and uh, Viluena uh, in uh, in the early noughties, so early 2000s. We have a fabulous team of naturalists, uh, Sri Lankan naturalists, one of including my colleague Ramani. She also leads in for NatHab in Switzerland, and so some of you may have come across her there, and in Borneo. Uh, but she was born in Sri Lanka, grew up in Sri Lanka, went to college in the, in the States. Um, uh, she has a Swiss mother, which, is, which gives her the skills and knowledge for leading trips in the Alps. But she's passionate about Sri Lankan wildlife. She's a marine biologist by training, but her, her is uh, passionate about the flora of the country. So I thought a little bit about the island, uh, about the country. Sri Lanka is a small country. It's about the size of West Virginia or Tasmania, tucked in under Australia. But it has great diversity. Uh, and the climate and topography actually make this an all year round destination. Um, there are we run this trip between January and April for a variety of reasons. I'm moving the cursor now, but come May, 
rains, the monsoon rains come in from the southwest and they sort of inundate the hill country and the southwest of the island bound by most of the places we go on this journey. Um, the, and the rains are expected from May through to September. The monsoons are getting later in recent years, thanks to all the shenanigans with climate change. Um, and um, sometimes the rains last till October. And then in November, December, rains come in from the northeast. It's the return monsoon. It's the monsoon that comes in uh, across the Bay of Bengal. So we time this to be hopefully as dry as possible. Now, it's a tropical island. It has uh, mountains going up to 8,000 feet in the center of the island, roughly where I'm turning the cursor now. And that they can draw in rain at any time. But while we do often get cloud, um, my the trips I've done over the last few years have had very little rain. I won't say we've had none, but it hasn't affected it in any major way. The journey starts obviously flying into Colombo Airport, which is about 30 miles north of Colombo City. And from there we go straight to a private organically managed coconut estate, but it's got much more than just coconuts on it gives you a chance to catch up. We recommend that you come in a day early so you have time to get in sync with the local, um, because of the change of time and also the change of climate, If you, especially if you're coming in January from a very cold North America to a warm Sri Lanka. Um, January is not hot by our standards, but it will certainly be hotter than some than many places in North America. This is a this itinerary is all done in road journeys, and we travel together in a in a minibus. The maximum size of the group is ten. Um, in recent years, we've been running them with six to eight people, which is a really nice number because we all we all have two seats in the minibus. We have space uh, to, on journeys for three or four hours. We have regular stops on these journeys. And we've got, you know, our hand baggage and all our little kit. It's our, in a sense, it's our home for the 10 days that you're in the country. So we go northeast from the Horitopolo estate to the area here around Dambulla and Sigiria. We spend two nights there. And I'll explain some of these places in a moment. Then we go south stopping at Kandy to visit a, temp a temple, which is perhaps the most important religious site in Sri Lanka, and then have lunch. And then we carry on and climb into the mountains to Nurelia at 1,000 feet. And it's from to our two nights in Nurelia that we go up to the Horton Plains National Park, which is cloud forest. And I'll come to that again a bit later. We then excuse me, Toby. We lost your um the sound was a little muffled. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry about Much that. Much better now. Much better now. Thank you. Okay, I'll lean in. Um uh so we go to the hill country, we base ourselves at Neuralia for two days at five thousand feet, and from there we go to the Horton Plains National Park. And then we carry on southeast down to the um through tea estates and to the Yala National Park, where we stay for three nights, three full days. That gives us plenty of opportunities. It's on the coast. And from there, we spend, we go to Bundala National Park uh, for a morning and then travel along the south coast for two nights at this point. And from there, we go out to sea to, for whale watching. And finally, at the end, we return to Colombo. So as I said, we begin by visiting this delightful uh, private uh, coconut estate. It has eight rooms and we take the entire property for the Nat Have journeys. Um, I always recommend that 
you come a day or two early. On a recent trip, I had someone who arrived three days early. Uh, she, she had come off a, a trip in India, the, the wild India journey, uh, and sort of needed a break between those two trips, and it worked out very well. The food, it's a, almost everything we eat at this, at Horitapola is from the estate. Whether it is the coconuts, whether it is the rice, or whether it is the pepper that is available. And the coconuts, which come off the tree fresh, drunk straight from the coconut, um, are fabulous. Um, I should just mention, and this photograph allows us to mention, we endeavor to run the Sri Lanka trips plastic free. And we, I won't say we are 100% successful, but I do believe we're 98% successful. So you'll never see a plastic straw being handed to you on one of these trips. Sri Lanka has one of the highest biodiversities in the world. It's, um, as I said, not a, a big country. Um, and the climate and the topography gives allows for this variety. It has many uh, endemic species, whether we have endemic primates, we have endemic snakes, which we, to be honest, do not see very many of. We have endemic lizards, which we do seek out because they're actually rather fun to find. And 34 species of endemic birds, which is quite high for a very small place tucked away at the southern part point of India. Elephants are the largest land mammal in the world and are the largest land mammal, obviously, in, um, in Sri Lanka. We get, hopefully, to see them in two places. One is near the beginning of our journey and later in the Yala National Park and possibly the Bundala National Parks on the south coast. Sri Lanka also has the largest creature ever known on our, to share the planet with us, which are blue whales, and I'll come to those in a while. We occasionally meet elephants on the roads as we are traveling, uh, this one being followed by a couple of egrets who pick up the insects as the elephant kicks up the dust. Going from the coconut estate and the well forested and well sort of wooded agriculture um, plantation, we go towards a place known as Sigiria. Sigiria is a fantastic rock fortress, which you can see in the distance here. And we stay at Viluena, which is a rewilded project start, started in the mid 20, in mid uh, 2000s, 2006 it opened, uh, covers about 28 uh, acres, and it was paddy fields. Um, and as you go to your rooms on these platforms, you still have rice growing between them. Occasionally your journey gets your passage gets interrupted by a peacock trying to sort of block your way. But the real, and the rooms look out over these fields, paddy fields, they're extremely comfortable. They're bright, large and spacious. With all mod cons, they also have attached pools. Little, but sadly, there's not enough time to always enjoy these places uh, because, because of the rewilding, it has amazing, uh, wildlife has come into the area, mostly small creatures, um, such as this gray grizzled squirrel, which is um, quite sort of habituated and we and they come up rather inquisitively to see people. They are not fed by, um, we don't recommend anyone tries to feed them. And it, but it's, it's the real joy of the place is being able to go out in the evenings. We use red light torches. Um, these, there's also a white light um, pointing to a, a bird that is actually roosting here. And when you see them through with the red light, they're just all the colors vanish into shades of gray, but they are, eyes are closed and they're there. And, but it is, the loris, 
small it's called proto simian or uh, um, primitive primate. Uh, it's the Asian equivalent of a bush baby, which you probably are familiar with from East Africa. And they have moved moved into the area 12 years ago, and now have a viable population. We are lucky enough to be able to see them. Um, we almost on every walk that we do in the evenings. Um, we have two evenings. We always go out on the first day that we arrive at this hotel, because if we, for any reason, um, miss them, uh, we have a second chance. There are also fishing cats, otters, jungle cats have moved in um, to the grounds at Viluena. As I said, it's a very successful rewilding project. And from there, just paddy fields 20 years ago, it now has 280 bird species resident, uh, not resident, sorry, uh, visiting through the year. The sort of geographical location for this lodge, this hotel, is the Sugiria Rock Fortress. And we visit this on one afternoon. It dates back to the fourth century fourth and fifth centuries of the current era. And we do have an opportunity uh, uh, to walk up to it uh, and, and onto it. There is a passageway. I'm moving the cursor right to left, and then we can go up. And those who wish to can go to the top. We always have a second guide with us in Sri Lanka. Uh, so for those people who do not wish to climb, we keep we keep them in the in the boulder garden, in the lower lower levels, and we go bird watching, we go mammal watching, we go primate watching. When I was last there, we saw all three of the primates, the monkeys that are found on Sri Lanka, two of whom are endemic. And from, and we just explore this and these amazing gardens that were built and laid out in the fifth century. And around the base of the rock, there are Buddhist caves that they, which are even older than the laid out gardens. Um, and this was a Buddhist uh, monk's retreat of about 2000 years ago. Um, and we stop, it's got some uh, inscriptions um, on the inner walls, and we point this out, uh, and it's, you know, you're just surrounded by history, and we can get immersed in it, but within this historical zone, there is fabulous wildlife. We move to a place called Polinoara, which is nearby, uh, which is famous uh, for the longest running research project um, on primates anywhere in the world. It's even longer than Jane Goodall's project at Gombe Stream on chimp for chimpanzees. And this was a Smithsonian project that started almost 50 years ago. Um, what makes it extraordinary is that the scientist who came out to do his PhD 49 years ago uh, is still there and he's running the research accompanied by the Sri Lankan uh, researchers, such as the one you see out of focus in the background as he as he was start keep watching his troops. The tokmakaks are an endemic species of monkey. They're fascinating, they're lovely, they're very funny. Um, but they're while they are used to humans, we never ever take food in. They do not beg, uh, unlike many urbanized uh, monkeys. Um, and the researchers explain the biology and the ecology of them. It's not just the tokmakaks, there's also the Sri Lankan race of langurs, uh, the grey langur, which we will find. And there is a purple-faced leaf monkey, which is also an, another name for a monk, uh, langur, which is endemic and in the same area. But this archaeological site, has one of the finest sculptures in the world. And I have something that I am 
extremely fond of sharing. This is where I spent three years making the Monkey Troop film for Disney and had earlier made worked on a film called The Temple Troop. Um, sorry, Monkey Kingdom was the uh, Disney film. The Temple Troop was a film I made for the BBC in 1996. So we go there and this is an opportunity for me to share my enthusiasms. I'm sorry, it's not, not, a very, not my finest profile, um, but it gives us an opportunity and it gives you, this photograph does give you an idea of the scale that we have of this extraordinary sculpture dating back a thousand years. So from Polnuara, we drive via Candy, where we stop for lunch, which is, a, um, as I said, the, the sort of cultural capital of Sri Lanka today. We visit this amazing temple. And we carry on to the hill country, a uh, very different landscape. Very, this is at about 5,000 feet, surrounded by tea gardens. You can see the trees, how different they are. Looks more like Scotland where I was last week. Um, the skies are brilliant. Um, and this small uh, six room property, which we take for um, for our guests, is very, very warm and cozy. And this is our base for going uh, to a place called um, Horton Plains. Horton Plains is another thousand feet higher. It is on a lovely bright day like this. We can go out in shirt sleeves and um, go birding and looking for insects. It also has these extraordinary uh, ferns, looking more like the sort of rainforests of southern New Zealand, but they're in, these are endemic species in Sri Lanka. And the plains themselves are vast and it's grasslands and stunted bamboo dwarf bamboo large species of deer such as the um, samba which is a forest deer similar to the red deer of europe or the elk there are leopards here there are monkeys here um, but and there are many many endemic species of birds and lizards. So it's in a place where we can walk. We're not always restricted to a vehicle. We can walk along trails and if we're lucky we can see these amazing little um, endemic lizards. This lizard is, I mean, to give you an idea of how close this is, this is a photograph I took on my phone um, a few months ago in, in uh, February. So it's only about five inches long. Um, and that's seeking out these creatures and looking at them. Obviously, we don't touch anything. and We never get really any closer than about five feet uh, is fabulous. It's also a time where those of you who have, you know, bring binoculars, it's, you can stand back and watch these creatures um, very comfortably from seven or eight feet away with your binoculars. From the mountains, we, this high area of Horton Plains, we then descend to Yala National Park. We, we wind through coffee estates. This is the longest journey of the, of the um, itinerary. It's about five hours, we stop halfway where we get a fabulous, this fabulous view, no, a place called known as Ella, E double L A. And the view away from Ella Rock, just successive folds of the mountains as they decrease and go towards the Indian Ocean. Yala National Park occupies the southeast corner of the country. Um, and here gives us an opportunity for seeing elephants yet again, uh, a wild Asiatic buffalo, and if we're lucky, leopards, which is the dominant predator in Sri Lanka. 
the landscape is actually quite varied. And when we where you have water, we have these fabulous uh, trees, locally known as kumbuk trees, uh, lining river these streams. And within these are full of birds, the sound of birds. Um, uh, elephants come down through these bushes to the water. Um, on occasions, if we're lucky, we will see a leopard. Um, and we stay under canvas. This is the only camp we stay at. It's extremely comfortable. It has uh, hot and cold running water with an attached bathroom for each of these tents. They're spacious. There's lots of place, places to lay out your baggage. All the hotels in Sri Lanka that we use have laundry facilities, all air conditioned, even these tents are air conditioned. Um, and they're all responsibly operated. Um, this camp, for instance, generates most of its, its energy through solar, um, as does the rewilded project I mentioned earlier called Viluena, with all those fabulous nocturnal animals that we go out and look for. The when we stay at this safari, this camp, it's again, it only has six very large uh, twin bedded or double bedded tents. Uh, there's, so there's room for everyone and we, we take the camp alone. Uh, this photograph actually shows my colleague uh, Ramani um, helping with the breakfast. Um, it's on the edge of a lake and the park boundary is about 400 meters away. So it's very easy to get in and out of the park. And we spend three nights at this fabulous location. When we're in these parks, uh, you can't walk in Yala, unlike, say, Horton Plains at altitude. We use land cruisers. We take a maximum of six people in each vehicle. Uh, we have a driver, obviously, and a tracker, and one of our, and each vehicle has a guide. So, with a maximum of ten people traveling on this NatHab trip in Sri Lanka, there is a, an, a guide, the expedition leader, at, and a local guide. With so there's one of those in each vehicle, each of the two vehicles that we need to use. So you have continuity from the day you arrive to the day you depart. You, are both, you experience both the services and the knowledge and the stories and the, hopefully the fun and pleasure with the expedition leader and the local guide. They're both, they both travel with you. If we're lucky, and I keep emphasizing luck because Although there's a certain amount of skill and being able to interpret tracks and signs and alarm calls, there is always an element of luck. Wildlife viewing is opportunistic. In Asia, perhaps much more than Africa, you have to go out and seek the animals. You have to look for them. You have to know where they are. And this is where the skills of our local guides and expedition leaders comes in. Um, there's, it's a sweeping generalization, but there's a sort of in many parts of Africa, you you can go to a place and wait for the wildlife to come to you. In Asia, be it in India or Nepal um, or Sri Lanka, you have to go out and look for it. And it's that seeking for the animals that is actually part of the fun. And, uh, and it gives you a much better understanding and appreciation that they are truly wild. And you can come around a corner and there standing in front of you is this magnificent elephant. And the elephants have an equally rare ability to just disappear into the bush. Within four or five yards, they can vanish. Um, we would think it's impossible, but they do it with great regularity and it's quite fun to experience. From Yala, we 
carry on, on along the south coast and we go to a park called Bundala, um, which is very close. It's only an hour from Yala. We stop beside the Indian Ocean on this cliff overlooking a that lo, lo, small fishing village, a settlement, a seasonal, uh, where about a dozen fishing boats come up onto the bank during the season. We stop, we have breakfast overlooking the Indian Ocean. Um, and then carry on um, along the coast. Bundala is a wetland. It has a good elephant population, has a great crocodile population, but it is it's also great for birds. And on my last trip to Shul um, Nathab trip, we did 158 bird species in the 10 days, and we added about 15 of them in the last day in Bundala, which was remarkable. These painted storks, uh, in their breeding plumage, as they would have in February, in end of January through to April, are spectacular and very exciting to watch them fishing uh, for crustaceans and mollusks and whatever in the mud. We then carry on the coast, and we what the one of the joys of this uh, itinerary is that we mix history cultural experiences and wildlife. It is predominantly a wildlife program, but one of the endemic plants of Sri Lanka is cinnamon. And although there is, are types of cinnamon that grow in other countries, including Southern India, China, Vietnam, Southeast Asia, the plant that grows in Sri Lanka is endemic and is unique to Sri Lanka. And that is why Sri Lankan cinnamon is considered so important and so good. We go to a cinnamon estate, which is run by actually by an, an Englishman who retired there, and we watch them take the bark off the off these um, twigs, these branches, which are harvested, and it is sustainable because the trees then keep growing, and they only take a few branches off a particular tree in a particular year, and they take the quills, which you can see here loose on the left and, the, and lying here or to further to the left, and then they make, they bring them together and into these bundles of quills, and you can see them drying in the roof. Um, and here on the floor, as the experience and the procedure is explained to us, by Rupert, who is the English owner of this um, fabulous estate. And he then takes us to his house uh, about, on the hill uh, behind and gives us a great lunch. And it's again, exclusively with natural habitat. That afternoon, we finally end up back on the south coast. The hill uh, where we have lunch overlooks this. So it's only two or three miles as the crow flies. And this is our final hotel that we stay at in the, on the itinerary. It has access to the beach. It has a pool. We, we, it's a small property now with 14 rooms. So we, ha um, we have twin and double rooms. We're not always alone here, unlike in some of the other properties. Uh, we are sharing it with others, which is actually quite fun. But this is our base, because the following morning, we go out to sea. Um, this is not the boat we use. We use a slightly smaller boat than this. And we only, the boat we use is exclusively for the group. But it does give you an idea of the occasionally the proximity we can have with a blue whale, the largest creature ever to share this planet. Here you have two, uh, a mother and calf uh, breaching. Normally we get to see the whales when they come up to the surface uh, and, and breathe. We see their spout, their plumes um, as they exhale. 
and then after a minute or so they dive and as they dive their tails come up and this is what we're lucky we will see these are photographs that i have taken on recent trips that have trips off the south coast of sri lanka this year I went out on a very cloudy day, and then you can see the sky was not very sort of inviting, but we had fabulous and unusual sightings. And I did two NATHAB journeys this year, and on both of them, I saw the, in January for the first time ever, and then again in February, I was lucky, we had about 25, 25 to 30 minutes with whale sharks, which are the largest fish in the oceans. And here is one eating krill uh, at the surface of the, of the sea, a few meters from our boat. This is a very, very, personally, a very, very exciting experience. Because of the topography of Sri Lanka, the high hills in the middle, the monsoon rains, there's a lot of runoff of soil and topsoil, agricultural uh, muck, which goes into the ocean around the island. But it, and that is very rich. So within about three to four kilometers, three miles of the coast, we find whales. So blue whales are resident. Sperm whales really come February, March uh, in small pods of 15 to 20. The largest I've ever seen was 28. Um, but they're not seen so often. I have seen orcas. Uh, there are the occasional humpbacks off the East Coast. I've never seen one off the South Coast of Sri Lanka. And we see a lot of thing, uh, dolphins and smaller whales, which are cool. But they're really dolphins that are cool whales, like pilot whales, bride's whales, fins whales, and we get spinners, spinner dolphins, and bottlenose dolphins around the boat. So it's very exciting, and um, you just realize how incredibly rich these waters are. So it's not only the land that is rich with a great diversity, so is the sea. There's about 1600 kilometers of coastline that's sort of must be about 800 um, miles of coastline so it's not a big place it's not a big island but they but it stretches out from within three to five miles maximum it's, it's of how far we go out to see we get to see some of these great creatures on various trips i was went out once with my grandson uh, and we saw cut, we saw a mass of cuttlefish coming in to, past the boat. On another occasion last year, uh, earlier this year, uh, we saw um, leatherback turtles and we saw hawksbill turtle uh, actually mating a pair of them in the ocean beside our boat. And these are pilot whales which run with the uh, with the vessel. From our, after a morning out on the ocean, we go out for anything between three and four and a half hours. We come back to our hotel and have lunch. And then later in the afternoon, we go to this the small town of Gaul. Uh, this sort of new town spreads in the distance, but you can see this little isthmus, which is fortified. It was first visited by Chinese sailors in the 14th century. Um, it was occupied by the Portuguese and then later the Dutch. And what we see and travel through is largely a creation of the Dutch um, in the 1700s. The Indian, the English East India Company took over what was then called Ceylon uh, many years ago in the 1790s and ruled until 1948 when Sri, when Ceylon became independent. The British didn't make much many changes to Gaul because the capital was Colombo. Uh, and we go into this lovely old town and uh, wander around and we 
had it's the one sort of shop shopping location on our itinerary it's a little chance for retail therapy at the end of quite intense wildlife viewing and we stay and have dinner in the evening and go back to our hotel uh, 30 minutes away along the coast um it's just a, it's sort of quaint it's charming it has nice little shops um and it's a great sort of uh, antidote to the, the the sort of faster paced uh, more intense wildlife experiences we've had on our last day we travel north from the, and uh, go to colombo we have lunch at a gallery restaurant which is also it's a uh, an art gallery but has this del delightful restaurant outside uh, where we, it's our opportunity for our final lunch there are a couple of things that um, I wanted to mention about Sri Lanka in the last few months it's or last couple of years it had a quite a lot of negative press around the world partly because of the fa economic failure that um, was caused by bad management uh, by the then government and the sort of political ramifications. There was an amazing um, response from people who realized that they had been taken for a ride by the government over the uh, and their mismanagement and the sort of kleptocrats that were running the country. And you would have read that the students and others, it wasn't, it was, wasn't just students, it was middle class people uh, from across the country, moved into Colombo and they occupied the president's office and the president's house until the president resigned. And the president did resign eventually and went into, had to leave the country. The day that that happened, the protesters moved out of the palace, they moved out of the office, and they didn't even take a paper clip. They did no that they did occupy the swimming pool and they did sort of open cupboards and drawers uh, and, and scatter things, but there was no damage. And it was a very peaceful demonstration in retrospect, but of course got blown out of all proportion by newspapers and press and 24-7 news. But the damage was done to the economy, had been done. The person who is now president is um, a technocrat. He's been involved in politics and in one sense he's sort of part of the problem, but he's handling the recovery extremely well. They've negotiated with the IMF and the World Bank, uh, a lot of aid is coming in from countries such as India. They're distance, distancing themselves from China, interestingly. Um, and the country is on the road to recovery. There were fuel restrictions at one point, but those have all gone. There are no restrictions for the movement of tourists in the country. The supplies, whether it's food or electricity, uh, is is has all been restored and recovered and I was there three I've been there three times this year I was there with Nat Hab tours in both January and February and I was back there in April um, and everything is operating perfectly well and perfectly normally there are fewer tourists um, than there were but actually that's quite a nice thing um, but I would say there is no there are there is a sort of travel warning I think on the State Department website at the level two, but that's sort of be careful crossing the road type advice, um, and also to you know listen to what your tour managers say and take their advice. But Sri Lanka is and really has been for as long as I've been traveling there a safe country to travel to. There was a civil war in the northern part of the country uh, 15 20 years ago and it went on for 20 years over 20 years but it was during that time that i was working in the country making films for pbs 
um, Discovery, BBC and Disney. Uh, and we were not inhibited in any way because we went and our tours do not go to that area. But that is history now. That's been that civil war and the civil disturbances has been over for over 15 years. And she, I would say Sri Lanka is a safe, comfortable and enjoyable place to travel to. I love it. I mean, I've been going there for years. I've seen it in its bad times. And now the good times are back. It also has great uh, cuisines and food. Um, and so there are many options. You do not have to be a lover of chilies to enjoy um, Sri Lankan food. It's not all hot and spicy. There are a lot of very fresh vegetables and fruits uh, available and some quite distinctive recipes. But all the hotels we stay at have a mixture of cuisines. So whether you wish to eat local food or continental food, those options are available wherever we stay. Um, there may be questions, uh, and I'll be happily answer them. Um, I hope I've conveyed some of my love and enthusiasm for this great country. It's very varied. It has thousands of years of history and has great biodiversity. And what more can you ask for in a, in a small country the size of West Virginia? Toby, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, that looks like an incredible trip. Um, we've already got a lot of people interested in asking questions, but I just want to remind everybody that they can submit their questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, the first question is, can you talk a little more about the physicality of this trip? Um, what sort of physical shape should people be in? What sort of um, criteria should they use to know if this is going to be the right fit for them? Happily. Um, you need to be sort of moderately fit and mobile. But, I mean, there are times when you can be more uh, vigorous, like climbing to the top of that uh, 5th century fort. But... I would say out of eight people, only three or four go to the top of that, do that climb, and four or five stay down at the bottom and enjoy the boulder garden and the, the forests and the other things that we can see at the base of the fort, of the, this huge rock. Um, so with the joy of having both an expedition leader and a local guide on these trips is that no one Need, need feel that, oh, I don't want to spoil the trip for others by not going on this because I have to stay back. All those things are taken into account. The only other place that is involves walking, but it's gentle walking, and it's um, is at Horton Plains. Um, there are no, there's no climbs. There are a few little slopes, but the same sort of slopes you'll get on a village road um, almost anywhere in the world. Um, but it is a plane, it is relatively flat. Um, there is an option when we're up there to go for a longer walk, um, but that is an option. So the local guide will can do that and the, and the others who do not take that longer walk, uh, which is about three hours, um, the expedition leader will take them to a botanical gardens, which was originally a chinchona, which is a, where a quinine was grown in the 1770, sorry, 1870s, and it then became a botanical garden in the 1890s. And within that garden, there are endemic primates. We see the montane race of the tokmakak, which is the brown monkey we saw photographs of earlier. And we see the montane race of the a purple faced leaf monkey, which is so woolly and furry up there that it's known as the bear monkey by right, locally. So there's, you can do as much as you wish to do. It is not a hard trip. I do it. I'm in my 60s. Um, 
I do it without any problems. Um, and I can't, th that's really the only, those are the two hard parts of it, which can involve physical activity. Uh, but there's always walking for those who want to walk. Uh, and it's not hard. Great. Um, did you mention if NADHAB goes to any tea growing regions or any experiences around the tea culture? When we are, I, I only mentioned that we drove through tea growing areas, um, but we do go and visit a tea estate uh, when we are at Neuralia. Uh, within 40 minutes uh, or 45 minutes, it's rather difficult to cram in everything that we will do in 10 days. Uh, so there have to be some things left to surprise you when you come to Sri Lanka. But yes, we do <laughs> visit the estate. We visit the tea factory where um, the tea is processed. As some of you may know the tea that you drink in your morning uh, cup is actually prepared within one day, 24 hours of being plucked. So there's once it's been plucked and packaged, that's it. Whether it's whether you drink it tomorrow morning or drink it in six months' time, it's perfectly good and it's the same. Um, so we involved that we show the pluck, we the growing, the plucking, the processing on a visit in the afternoon while we're after after we've been to Horton Plains. Hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the pace of the day? Um, there are some folks who are interested in photography and are just wondering, you know, how leisurely the activities are, if there's time to, you know, capture photographs along the way. I'm a photographer and I've been taking photographs most of my life. And I always come back with more than I expect to take on a trip on these trips, despite having been on these journeys many, many times. Um, we start early, we get out where almost wherever we are, we start um, sort of at dawn. And whether it's in the park, such as Bundala and Yala at, towards the end of the trip, or going to Polonuara to look at the monkeys and the monkey researchers, which we do early. Um, and then when we're there, we spend three in the parks, anything between three and a half and five hours before we come back. We have breakfast in the park before we come back to the lodge for lunch, the camp for lunch. And then we go out again in the afternoon for three and a half to four hours. The, we can stop at any time for people to take photographs. Um, we try and do it as fairly and evenly for so all members of the group get the opportunity. In the vehicles, everyone has a side as a window, or I mean it's open sided, so everyone has a seat on the side. There's no one in the no middle, there are no three benches of three people, someone stuck in the middle. Everyone has a side. Of course, there are occasions where God, I wish I was on the other side. Uh that wouldn't that have, you know. But you'll never miss something. You just you have to be alert, um, and your expedition leader and local guide are always there to help you, to make suggestions if you need them, um, and uh, also as you get to, as the trip evolves, we all get to know each other better. We know what some people like, what they're looking for, and we do our utmost to make sure that is done. Mm. I think we have time for one more question. Um, often there are people who are traveling alone. Can you talk a little bit about um, how NatHab is able to match folks up if they'd like to share a room or uh, single supplements or anything that relates to traveling solo? We've designed these trips and use properties where we can have and can get uh, twin bedded rooms or single rooms should they be requested for. Uh, so no, no, we have double rooms, twin bedded rooms and single rooms. Um, if it's an individual who wishes to, there is a single supplement on this itinerary uh, and anyone who um, 
pays that. It's got a guaranteed room on their own. Um, for matching up, uh, over the years, I found cup, uh, two friends often travel together, um, people they've met on earlier trips, and they share a twin bedded room. Uh, and it's I, I, I actually have never come across any sort of tensions. The sort of uh, that matching up is done in Den in Boulder when you when the bookings are made, um, either at the request or of the of the um, your request as a traveller. Um, but if you wish for a single room, they're available. Well. That's the last uh, question we have time for, so I will hand it back to you for closing comments. Well, um, thank you all for listening. Very great, um, interrupting your day to, to listen to me talk about a place that I love and I'm fascinated by. Nearer the time, the trip before when you sort of before you come on the trip, we will do another briefing of sort of in more detail of what to bring. I mean, if you, for instance, you suffer from sleep, sleep apnea, there's no problem with electricity in your rooms. The, you, there's no problem in carrying um, the kit that you would need to carry. Um, and we will address all those sort of details about cameras, about clothing, climate. It depends whether you, if you, in January, you know, you do need to bring a, a fleece or something because when we go into the high areas, the Horton Plains, it can be chilly, especially in the mornings. But in April, end of March, April, the days are generally warm and um, you definitely need to wear a hat when we're out in the parks. But having said that, the Jeeps do have covers on top. Mm. So I look forward to meeting you in Sri Lanka in uh, 2024 or 25 and um, I can just promise you a wonderful trip and a wonderful experience set of experience so, thank you Toby thank you so much for taking the time to present to us today I also want to thank everybody who tuned in please join us again tomorrow for our next daily dose of nature you can check out this week's lineup including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.